Okay, so here we go. Right, we talked about mirror neurons. Oh, I guess I can't do that with this time. So we talked about mirror neurons. As you well know, while I'm doing this right now, that part of your brain, if we fmri you, would be in fact firing in regards to scratching your arm. However, you would not be feeling what I am feeling right now, even though your mirror neurons are doing that. Okay, so you ready for this? God, do I love this. If you numbed your left arm, listen to this, if you numbed your left arm and I start scratching, you will feel, he says in a squeaky voice, hi, good morning, good timing, you will actually feel what it is I am doing in that part of your body. What? Unbelievable. You and I are, I vow, talk about bimonic state. So what it is, as it turns out, is the physical receptors in the arm in a sense are cueing or in a sense turning off the mirror neurons, not really turning them off, but are telling the mirror neurons, hey listen, that scratching feeling is out there with that person, not with you. So you don't need to feel that directly, even though you will move as if you're doing it. When you numb the arm, it bypasses that system. So it's as if our primordial system is, we are all one. And our physio system has to say, oh no, by the way, we're actually separate individuals. That's just so incredible. Remember I told you about the little girl who came because her grandfather died? We all come from one sun and then we're like separate lakes? Well, in a way, it's the neural basis of exactly what she's saying. That is just so cosmic. And apparently, perhaps, maybe, psilocybin and some of these kinds of drugs, altering drugs, what they might do, it's just spe total speculation, I so could be wrong on this, is disrupt that system so that now we do experience what you're experiencing directly. We are one. It is unbelievable. So then I started thinking, we have little pumpkins. We have, what, till age about three months, there's, is it synesthesia? Where they have not separated out all their different senses, right? They're kind of all, with what you hear, see, feel, it's all kind of oneness. I bet they haven't mirrored out their mirror neurons that way, haven't sequestered this system. So I bet they really do feel what mommy feels or others feel in a direct fashion. Wow, that is so intense. So that whole thing is first we are we, then we are a we, me, then we are a me, we, and then eventually we're a me and a we. That probably has a lot of neural basis in terms of we are really a we way in the beginning. <coughs> Profound. I think that's profound. Anyway, you should see that tweet. Look for it. It says mirror neurons in civilization. Because what he makes the case for is we have civilization because of mirror neurons. It's just beautiful. He calls them the Gandhi neurons, these ones that will. Yeah. So, you brought up a point in email about reasoning and discipline. So, do you want to say something about that? And we'll have a discussion and then we'll move on. Um, well, you are talking about like, I'm trying to explain and reason to a little kid like why something is bad or like it's, it's the money thing. And then like a little kid, a little kid steals money from you and then like, I'm so sorry if I make you feel afraid. It's like, right. I think that sometimes not as fear maybe, it's not the right word, but it needs to be used to teach and to like make sure that they don't do that again or else if you get you know, later in life, I just, you're misunderstanding me, but I felt like you're saying that to explain to me that that's not okay, to like apologize and like make them kind of have the upper hand. Okay, so I have three thoughts. One is I could have you then play the other side, because I know you can kind of argue each way. We could do that. I could respond. We could have the class respond. You think? What, 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 let's have the class respond. What do you think to what Melissa is saying, if you understand what her point is? The apology is not to give the child the upper hand. The apology is, um, and again, it's if I've made you feel afraid. It's, um, I don't know, you're asking the child basically to internalize the value of not taking something that doesn't belong to him 
as opposed to using fear to force him to internalize it. I don't think that it's either or. I don't think you have to either use fear or not. I mean, there's... You're right, and people have been using fear for decades and generations, and... Eons. And it... I had this discussion with my husband, actually, and according to him, you know, it works just fine. Why, why not keep using it? But I think, personally, that the non-fear-based method is a better method. It's just like, you know, people were smoking cigarettes when they were pregnant decades ago, but now we know it's bad for you. So now that we know that there's a better way, why keep using the old way just because it's more comfortable? So I guess that's my somewhat emotional response. Okay, and you have a response? Uh, well, initially I kind of thought the same way. I was like, oh my God, try to tell a Middle Eastern parent to like apologize to their kid when they they steal, they're gonna like laugh. They're gonna be like, what kind of thing is this that you're trying to teach us? But then I thought about, well, it's more about strengthening the relationship between the parent and the child. And that is like a key thing that I feel like is lacking. So, but at the same time, I was kind of thinking, how do you do that? And I think it depends on your particular relationship with the child, because if you see that your child is doing things, or if you see a child doing things that are inappropriate and they are concealing or hiding, things like that, then like you do need to address like the relationship. And I think the apology is to address the relationship aspect versus what actually transpired. So it's like the process versus like the content. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I, that was just one example of like the, the reasoning part of things that I just sometimes yeah, don't and I any reason with the child, and I can set you up in the email. Um, like they're older, like yeah. Right. But um, and I was also thinking of an example. Like I have a little boy that I've been bringing, and I've been babysitting him since he's like one and a half. And I remember when he was like two, and he would be up on the table, like freaking out, like on the dining room table, up high, and his mom would be like, "Okay, see that hard floor down there? That'll hurt your head." Like he, that reasoning with him, like I was like, "No, get down off the table. Like you know, that's you're not supposed to be up there. You're not." Trying to explain to him like, well, if you fall, then you're gonna crack your head, and we're gonna like he that was just that okay. whole thing just seemed kind of so like depending on the kid's temperament too, like how they look. The two year old, the two year old really like is that well yeah that seems like developmentally like that doesn't matter to them. They're not gonna understand like that <laughs> in and out doesn't matter that. Okay, any other comments uh, before I come in? Well, I think, I think it depends. Like, on that, you know, like, I would probably be say something like, oh, it's not safe, or let's be safe, and that's it. Yeah. Because they're not going to, you don't really need to explain something like that to a yeah. two-year-old. So I think it depends on, like, the age of, obviously, developmental. Um, you know, they're just they're kind of, they just need basic um, kind of rules. They don't really know what. Yeah. Um, but I think for the apology piece, I think, it would be different, like the, the setup was that there was fear in the face of the child, and so, and if that was like the, the intervention was because he, would, he or she was fearful, I think it's different if it was like, more like anger or like, you know, sticking it here and like not caring, then I don't think that would, the like apology approach would be appropriate. Well, can't you portray that they shouldn't be afraid without apologizing just by approaching it in a certain way? Like, I mean, if the kid looks afraid, right. Good, they know they did something wrong. That doesn't mean you have to like, rah, 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 rah. But you're like okay, well, you know, like this is not right. We don't steal, you know, X, Y, Z or whatever. But you don't, I don't. It's the apology part that got me to start off by saying, I'm sorry that you feel afraid. Well, <laughs> don't steal. <laughs> <laughs> you have a comment because that's really important. I want to comment what you have a comment. You have a comment. I was just thinking before about the fact that I guess how you start approaching with the baby is how you're going to approach always. It's not that because they're small, you're going to think in your mind, oh, get off the table, and then when you're like six, it's going to be, oh, now you're going to get, it's just like a way that you approach, it's going to just stay like that. Not because they change their age, you're going to start changing your mind. Okay. I guess it's a mindset. You should, though. I mean, it's, it's well, it's not easy. easy. Where they are, are, because then when you're afraid, because then it's your fear of them getting hurt. So if you're afraid of them driving a car or whatever, it's going to be always your impact. Like, oh my god, no, don't do that. I'm, Get down, get down. It's not because you don't, it's because you're afraid of them getting hurt. So it's more of explaining to them, like, you should get down because of it. So then they're still too tiny, they don't understand compared to when they're bigger. Well, I don't think at two years old it's like stupid that they can handle Well, no, but there's no, I don't think there's any point in like elaborating on, you know, the floor is hard, and you know what I mean? Like, they're two, they're. 
Okay, let me say a couple things. I love the discussions. In the stealing money thing, you're right that the fear was already there. That fear did not motivate that child not to take whatever they wanted to take. So fear wasn't a motivator for them. You're like, leave my banana peel alone. I can't believe that you have the audacity to cross my boundary. And besides, there might actually be some it's edible. It's dirty. So there's already fear there. I, I, so the fear did not motivate or, or stop the child from, we'll put it in parts, the part of them that's fearful because the part of them that knows that this isn't right to do didn't dominate the part that goes, oh my god, a banana peel, never mind money, I really want this. Didn't work in that sense. I don't think, I, I don't think fear is a useful motivator in relationship. I'll put this. The fear is inherent there because of the closeness. Or to put it differently, because of the fear of the disconnect. As you know, my premise, it's all about connection. And acts that disconnect us scare us. I think I have much more influence if, if and when we're connected. I will reflexively reflect. Oh my God, I see you're scared. I do own that there might be something in this relationship that I have done to create that sense in you. So I'll apologize, because I don't think that's useful. I, because I, the moral compass that's already in there, I believe, is mostly based on empathy. I empathize with you. I understand. I get it. You feel really close to me. You want that closeness. You do an act that breaches that closeness. That feels bad. Whether that's fear, disgust, shame, a whole bunch of things. You're in a battle between a part of you that wants to take and a part of you that doesn't. I honor that. I want to help the part that doesn't. I believe in the relationship and giving you some options and saying, I understand you really wanted that. I'm wondering what you might want for it. I want a Barbie. Totally get that. Let's find a way that you can get a Barbie without you having to steal and then lie, which creates distance. See, that's a problem for me with lying. Again, not all lies are bad. Is it creates a distance between us and I want to feel connected. And so then you're going to feel bad. So how do we do this? And how do I be with you? Because it's just an act of nature that I was born first. So I have the power in some ways. But I think I get more power in terms of impact if I own my own. And say, I'm really sorry. I had a guy the other day, his daughter's so mad, I'm doing reunification therapy. She refused to come. She refused to even go to the evaluation, blah, blah, blah. Courts finally said, you're coming. He was so good at saying, I am so sorry that I yelled at you. It was totally wrong of me. Totally wrong of me. I did awful things that way. And she was like, wow. I think there's a lot of power in the owning and in the internalizing. And the fear is already there. In terms of a kid climbing, first thing I would say is, I mean, first of all, that's a primal fear is the, is the falling thing. So I, I agree. I don't think I need to explain. By the way, if you fall, you're going to crush your head. Usually they're like, whoa, man, that's a basic along with loud sounds. But the first, what is the first thing I would say if I see a kid, he's climbing, he's all excited. I'm up on here. What do I say? Uh, yeah, exactly. I would mirror what they're thinking about. It looks like it's a lot of fun for you. What's the trait that I would, you know, if I'm a tradeologist, what trait am I going to exemplify? Yes! Wow, you're really excellent. Except I'm not, I don't like how. It's not working for me. I see you having a great time. And by the way, I'd be saying that as I'm walking over. It's not like, I see you having a good time. By the way, I'm like, I see you having a great time up there. And I see you have such an adventurous spirit. Whee! And you like to Superman around to the ground where it's safe. I worry, and I would say that's my worry, obviously not yours, that you might fall and go dunk, dunk, dunk. I mean, I make sounds. I kind of do it on their level. There was a guy at you know, his 15 minutes of fame was how he talked to, to two-year-olds, two and three-year-olds. And he basically did, he said, like, caveman talk. Oh, me want banana. Banana tastes good. Oh, I don't like you telling me not have banana. I mean, I swear to God, that's how he did it. It was really, you know, he was on all, all, he was on all that stuff. He made a huge hit. Obviously, you've never heard of him. But he had that 15 minutes. And I thought, oh, well, I liked it by what he was doing. By Monic. He was being very at their level. So I don't know, I'd say, you know, oh, you hit my, you know, 
crack open your cranium and then you might get forced. Like, kabash! Ow! Holy shamoli! But yea, for your adventurous spirit, that will serve you well in life. Um, so, I don't, you know, the dialogue to be continued, but I just think we impact through relationship, and we have relationship through mirroring and empathy. I do do the practicing right from the start. I did talk to Rory Stomach or to Duran when he was a mere belly and say, you're all in there, I'm thinking you're probably all cozy, and oh, you're kicking, you're kicking. Oh, you know how to express yourself. I mean, I really did all that. Do I have any delusion that that in any way is, he's like, oh man, I feel so I bow with you out there, I can't wait to get out there. No, not for a second. I'm practicing a way of being so that when he's, never mind, three or 19, it's been habitualized in the repertoire of our relationship, so it's automatic. I'm almost finished with this app for little pumpkins, for zero to two-year-olds, basically three-year-olds. And it's all about, as you well imagine, mirroring. It's basically what we're going to do today, a really, really direct mirroring. And the assumption is you're creating a, a way of being with this child that's going to really serve you well and this child, never mind when they're little, but when they get bigger and bigger and bigger because it's the currency of the contact. This is how we've always been. And hopefully you feel safe. And the reason you don't take it is because, ugh, mommy will feel really bad if I take her money. I understand that. And I don't want her to feel bad. I feel bad. She feel bad. So, and I know she negotiates with me. I know she'll listen to me. So, hey, mom, I really want that Barbie. I really want that Barbie. Can we, how about allowance? I know I'm only two and a half. I mean, obviously a two and a half year old wasn't going to have fun. But you know what I mean? We, we have a relationship where, like Mrs. Taylor or whatever, I know you value my experience and we can negotiate. I have power here with dignity between us. I wouldn't use those words necessarily with a two-year-old. Oh, dignity is, though I like the concept. Not that you're wrong, though. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Like, I get it. I'm not like advocating you. No, I know you don't. Of course not. Realize sometimes that work. Yeah. Well, and we can certainly over explain. I used the word hypotheses the other day. I'm trying to teach this kid, she's about 12, no, 11. How, she's always assuming, again, a very amygdala paste, that if somebody's mad, if somebody's got a grumpy face, they're mad at her and whatnot. I happen to be by the cove, so I have barking seals, a night and day. If you want to buy a $20 million house on the cove, down there, know that the seals go uh, 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 all day and all night long. Uh, uh. So I said to her, you know, we're hearing that seal out there going uh, uh. Maybe it's uh, uh, because it doesn't like what I'm saying. You know, it's probably not hearing me, but maybe they got really good ears, and maybe that's one possibility, a hypothesis, an idea about what might be causing that. It might be they're saying, Hey, move over. I need some more space. Uh, uh. It might be saying, man, am I hungry? I'm smelling fish. Uh, uh, give me the fish. I, you know, so I'm just saying there's many possible ways of looking at any one thing. So we might reason in that way to some child in some sense. I use the parts all the time. There's a part of you, even for that little two-year-old, I know there's a part of you who loves to have adventures, and I know there's a part of you that wants to be very safe in the world. Okay. The discussion will continue. I love the questions. Let us talk about play, and let me give you an unbelievably non-parsimonious definition of play. But do, do we cover it enough, by the way, Melissa, at least? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, no, absolutely. You bring up something, I'll bring up something. Oh, but about the paper, though? Oh, right. So did that become clear that, oh, no, oh, I think I went, I think I went over there. I think I need to come back. Thank you. God, you're great. So the third thing that's due, no, fourth, be here, do final, be here with the kids, be here with the kids, thank you. Tweet something to me, something that's of interest to you in the world. Whatever, if it's an article you read somewhere and you've scanned it in and you can tweet that, you can figure out how to do that. If it's a website you saw, if it's another tweet, something of interest related to this class or the human condition, as I say, and tweet it to me, like this Ramachandran thing. That was fantastic, like, whoa, that's really interesting. 
So you, have you sent me, you've all sent me some nice tweets. Those of you, I think you tweeted to me, did you? Right, which one? Did, oh, you tweeted that wonderful thing about autism and augmented play. Great, wonderful. You found that somewhere? You, you've learned how to tweet? You tweeted to me? I retweeted to you. So that's a separate assignment. And then the fifth thing is some kind of reading, whether it's, you know, I got you those compendium readings, right? I've, I send you all kinds of things to read or view. Comment on it. Comment on it. React to it in whatever way you want, whether you write it out or draw it out. I don't care. Some reaction. I need some prefrontal to understand what your reaction is. Thank you. Yay for the artistic magic mind. And then email that to me. Here's my reaction to whatever. Okay, so that's, I'm sorry I haven't been clear. That's separate from the tweeting to me. But hopefully it's not overburdensome. No, I knew there were two different ones. I didn't know if one of those tweet our reactions. Well. Oh, even simpler question. Tweet, tweet. <laughs> no, I please just keep, I know people use tweeting as all that stuff. I, I'm not quite as facile with that yet. I like to have emails for papers and stuff. Tweeting for the tweet stuff. Okay, I'll try to keep that up. Well said. And this is a powerful yonder. Okay, now I'm going to have this camera also on. Because that way I have direct access to what it is I've done. Here we go. Now I'll take a moment. <sighs> da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. Come on, little camera. By the way, when my app is done, you'll all get a little copy. I'm really happy with this thing. It's very cool. Okay, what are you doing? You're looking at the ceiling. Oh, that's weird. Okay, trying a different angle. Okay. Do you need help? Yeah, I think this will be okay. This is over here. Da, 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 da. Good enough. Okay, we're rolling. I'm going to give you an unbelievably non parsimonious definition of play. Since this class is about play therapy, I figured I'd better define play. So I kind of threw in anything and everything I could think about in terms of what might be relevant in terms of play. So it's going to fill up this blackboard, or whiteboard, whatever you call it. And then we're going to go through each one of the little items I bring up. Okay? So play is, play is an intrinsically motivated, well, it's an activity. Anything, everything's an activity. And it's a language. <laughs> it's embedded in a developmental stage. <laughs> by which the child communicates. <laughs> manipulates, manipulates and explores okay so play is an intrinsically motivated activity in language embedded in a developmental stage by which the child communicates manipulates and explores her his Relevant, relevant concerns, perceptions, I mean you can just add a bunch of words here, conceptions, <laughs> experiences, and feelings, you could add a bunch of other stuff but that's alright. <laughs> with the possibility of with the possibility of resolving and expanding expanding 
her his way of managing. <laughs> and assimilating, assimilating such, oh God, here comes psychology's favorite word, issues. Mm -hmm. Play is an intrinsically motivated activity in language, embedded in a developmental stage, by which the child communicates, manipulates, and explores. Her or his relevant concerns, perceptions, conceptions, experiences, and feelings, with the possibility of resolving and expanding her or his way of managing and assimilating such issues, as well as. <laughs> Developing, learning, practicing, and mastering. Mastering. New perceptions. And actually, put here. And abilities in a context that is understood to be make believe. Whew. Is that all? Actually, new perceptions, concepts. New perceptions, concepts, and abilities. Let's put concepts, because that's schemas. Play is an intrinsically motivated activity in language, embedded in a developmental stage, by which the child communicates, manipulates, and explores her his relevant concerns, perceptions, conceptions, experiences, and feelings, with the possibility of resolving and expanding her his way of managing and assimilating such issues, as well as, Developing, learning, practicing, and mastering new perceptions, concepts, and abilities in a context that is understood to be make believe. Intrinsically motivated. You show me a little pumpkin who is not playing. I will show you, pardon me, one sick little cookie. That is a beyond huge problem. You have a little pumpkin who's not playing. Perhaps pervasive developmental disorders. Perhaps a schizophrenic type of, a pre morbid schizophrenic type of situation. Later on, you have an unbelievably OCD ish type kid. They sometimes won't play. It's a very pathonomic sign if a child doesn't play. That's why it's wonderful, for example, the article you sent about augmenting play with folks who don't typically do that in the way that at least we're used to, in a way that can be useful. That's really, really helpful. It's intrinsically motivated. It's in the bioplasm of your being to play. Remember I mentioned one way to look at, you know, we're talking about everything's about connection. So one way to look at developmental stages is what are they connected to? And from zero to two, they're mostly connected to caregiver, which generally is mommy and also daddy. And more. But pretty soon, they start getting connected as the, about age, this is the embedded in developmental stage, they start getting connected to their magic mind. And from about two to six, they are very, they're mostly in their magic mind for neurobio reasons as to what that magic mind does for them. So obviously it's an activity, it's a language. Play is a language. It communicates about what's most important to them. It's embedded in developmental stages. Zero to two, if you ever read Piaget, is very motor-based. We've got to do neural wiring to be able to grab, but more importantly, initially, to be able to let go. 
because we're first, we already got the sucking and grabbing. We need to work on and develop the letting go. And that's why I'll get a little one-year-old at the restaurant just dropping everything and having the greatest time watching parents go nutso and picking it up. Here, just leave it there. <laughs> Apprehension, being able to let go. Building neural tracks. As I said, from about two to six. Magic, mind, magic, mind. If you want to look at from Piaget in terms of assimilation and accommodation. Remember assimilation, accommodation. Assimilation is defining it as to I, how I will. Accommodation is to accommodate to the world. Little pumpkins have to, we have to do both obviously, in order to build a schema of representation, internal representation of the world. Assimilate, I make it what I want it to be. Magic mind is extremely assimilative. This isn't a pen, it's a rocket ship. I am defining this to be a rocket ship. Accommodating is to be able to say, yes, this is a pen and this is how you use it, a marker. And this is how you use it. Zero to two, they're learning a lot of accommodating. Accommodation, how do, how do I engage in this world? What do I need to do? Even if it's going, wah, oh, that brings mom. They start getting into magic mind, and they are very, very assimilative. But they are doing, remember a lot of neurology in the beginning is pruning. Little infants have more neurocells than we do. They have to prune it, prune it, prune it, and start defining it. Again, the first, what was it, two months, three months, synesthesia, they don't even separate hearing from seeing from doll impacts on the same. Oh my God, we gotta do a lot of pruning and channeling. Keep things clean. Play will do that. When you get to about age six, seven, they start to become a little more, or a lot more accommodating because they have to acculturate. And now all of a sudden what's really important? Rules. <coughs> what's the most common word you hear? What's going on right now in the playground over there, Thurman? That isn't fair. It's not fair. Let me give you a sidebar, but a relevant sidebar on this. I just, because I just read this. 15 month old, 15 month old little pumpkins already have a sense of fairness. Remember the monkeys and bananas? That ain't fair, that monkey's getting a banana and I didn't have to work for it and I say, see it's primate, never mind primordial in us, it's trans species, that sense of fairness. So 15 month old, if I divide up between the two of you, food in equal fashion, candy bars or whatever, or if I give you more and you less, they will notice that difference. And the way they measure how infants notice things is by how long they look at it. And it bothers them, they look at, when it's not equally divided at 15 months of age. Furthermore, when you have those little pumpkins share a couple of favorite toys, the ones who are more willing to share their toys spend significantly more time noticing when it's not fair. Built into the bioplasm of the being is a sense of fairness. That becomes really important when you're in that six, seven, eight, nine, because now you're acculturating all kinds of rules about what is or isn't fair, right? So your play changes. Whether it's sports, right? All kinds of rules in sports. I never totally understood all the ones in soccer. I'm watching, I don't, I don't understand when they're offsides. And I was like, why? Why can't you run? Oh, you can't run. Uh, wrong. They keep track of all that stuff, all those rules. They have to accommodate enormously to become attached to that, the rules, the principles, the right ways to do things. So their play is different. I remember Goldick, my best buddy. November 3rd is his birthday. And I would play army. So on the one hand, it's kind of metaphoric, because we're not really soldiers, we know that. But we had all these rules of engagement. And we'd hide and whatnot, and boom, I got you. Why? Well, because you came through that third bush, and I said, if I caught you by then, then oh, okay. We had all these rules and play into our metaphoric minds. When you see the wonderful filial therapy tape, and that kid's probably 10-ish or something. He's doing a whole bunch of magic play, but now he's using his dad as the object instead of the little toy thing. And 
He has a bunch of rules about, well, you got to do this, and then you got to do that. Okay? So the, obviously the child's communicating. The child is actually manipulating and exploring things that are important to them. How they view the world. How they conceive of the world. What their experience is being. What their feelings are. This fact that it manipulates is unbelievable. We have the, we, we have the beyond privilege of being able to immerse ourselves in a, th pardon me for the intrusion, the 3D representation of an inner aspect of self. Remember, we are symbol-making creatures. Everything, everything is a symbol for some aspect of self, no matter how mundane that might be or how profound it might be. So when, they are, when you, later on today, come up and play with this little house, oh my God, one of, one of you brave ones is going to do that, please. You're playing with an aspect of yourself. Remember when I had you whisper, I'm home at last. And how that felt, the scheme of home? Well, here's a 3D representation, as silly as it might look, of home. And your magic mind can't help but have all kinds of associations, even though it's a silly little piece of plastic, to home. It's an aspect of yourself. Home. So we get to actually join the child and not only is she going to show, is she going to show us these aspects of self, but actually we get to manipulate them. If you ever read Kohut and Kernberg and those people, and you read all about internal objects, imagios, all that stuff, and just seems so like quantum mechanics of the soul. Well, you get to have a 3D representation of it anytime you're playing with a child. There's aspects of self. Little Bambi, Godzilla, aspects of self. There's a possibility in doing this that they resolve they, the, whatever the thing that's bothering them. That they expand their way of viewing them. Ergo, they change their schemas. Ergo, changing schemas. Let me give you a real quick and powerful example. I saw a little three-year-old. No, four little four-year-old who had been basically tortured by her drug addict mother, who dumped her purposely into a scalding hot bathtub and scarred her legs. I was, I was in the office with Tom Rusk in those days, and our office was kind of like this. So you come up the stairs and here's the greeting area. We actually had secretaries, lovely Jan and Marianne. So you come in, here's Tom's office, here's Yanan's office. There's a reason I'm doing this, by the way, obviously. Here's a hallway and here's the waiting room and here's another office. Well, right here <clears throat> is a bathroom. And Judy Russ, Tom's wife, did a marvelous job of decorating it. So here's the sink and here's a bathtub. And she had this wood stuff over and all kinds of green ferns and whatnot. So it really you know, didn't look like a bathtub. Well, pre-session one with Little Pumpkin, she walks in with her foster mom. Ah! All she had to do was see the porcelain on the side of the bathtub. Oh, that must have been really loud. I said, man, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. I forgot I might. That must have been just like, <laughs> we should have a little warning ahead of time. <laughs> to her bathtub, little cloud lights, equals implement of torture. That is her schematic culmination based on experience of what is bathtub. So all she had to do was see the porcelain and she literally ran out. We had to go get her. We had to close that door. Henceforth we had to make sure whenever she came that the bathroom door was thoroughly closed. She knew very well what was in there. She would kind of cling and well, boom, come right into the office, etc. She was in a very good foster home. She's in a good daycare. She's having a lot of positive experiences. 
as you might imagine. Four, six months into the therapy, what little object did she start obsessively playing with? A bathtub. I had a little yellow plastic bathtub. And she would take that bathtub and she would put little figures in it and take them out and put them in and take them out and put them in. And take them out. And then, after doing that for, I don't know, a month or so, whatever, she decided and said, can we go into the bathroom and can we fill up the sink and I can put the figures in the sink. So we did that. She still was kind of weary. She looked at the bathtub, but she put her back to she did the sink. And I asked the foster mother, had she taken a bath yet? No, not yet. But after about a month or so of that, and I'd see her every other week, she was a medical case. Lo and behold, foster mom comes and says, you won't believe it. She's taking baths. No, she's taking baths. She loves baths. Big bubbles and all that, the little yellow quacky dock and the ships and blah, 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 blah. It's hard to get her out of baths. So in fact, she wanted me to take all the ferns and everything off so she could go look at and play with the figures in the bathtub. What a great look you have. What a great look you have. Now, I'm not just saying just doing the play changed all this. All these different things. The relationship with that incredibly wonderful foster mom. Her relationship with me. Her relationship with a lot of things. And also her ability to be able and the necessity for her to play what we call play it out with this little object. Totally changed her schema. So no longer does this equal torture. This equals oh, warmth, nurturance, comfort. Yay! Yippee! It represents the world. Remember, all, it's all about representation of self, other, in the world. And it all got amalgamated into the symbol, if you will, of bathtub as a representation of self, other, in the world. And it changed how she saw that and related to that. And now she runs Bed Bath & Beyond. No, I don't know. <laughs> she worked. <laughs> be perfect. Be perfect. My mom thought she worked at something. <laughs> Bath products. Okay? Changes your experience of how you schematize self, other, and the world. When she played with it, when she first started, did she make it that the, the little figures were getting hurt? Or was no. it all positive? It's well, positive. It, it was neutral ish. It was kind of experimental. It's like, would this fit in there? Fits in there. Hmm. It was almost blank, and like then it became more. Imitate the negative. Things of course. And like, if their grandmother died and it happened suddenly, and they saw it happen or something, they'll you know lay on the floor and be like, "I'm dead. I died." Right. You know, and they'll do stuff to imitate. Right. So I was curious to see yeah. how she. I think it was so loaded for her. We're going to talk about this make believe part. That it. It. I mean, it's really, really low. So even with the boundary of safety that play provides. It is so dangerous that she had to start it as a neutral and then a positive and not do the negative part. That's just so overwhelming. Her protect and that's not a perverse protector, that's her positive protector. Because I'm not gonna have you overwhelmed. <sighs> Possibility of planning his way of marrying such issues as well as developing, learning, practicing, and mastering new perceptions and abilities. You pretty much can't be it unless you first played it. The way you learn to become who you are in the world is through what we call play. In fact, let me, let me give you a little other definition here. Play is the, and we can add whatever you want, neuro, psycho, bio, endrico, logical, or physio, because it's physiological scaffolding I spell scaffolding scaffolding of human competence play is a new whatever neuro psycho bio endrico physiological scaffolding of human competence you know you watch kitties oh god they're so fun to watch talk about play by the way I sent you an article 
And that was through Files Anywhere, about play and other species. We are not the only species that play. Even wasps play. So please take a quick look at that. It's a short one little page thing. Just look at it. Kitties, of course, play. In fact, they auto-play, man. You don't even have to give them the string thing. You give them the string thing, they're like, oh, they're like, auto-play. They're like, Wee! and there's like nothing there, unless they're seeing this other dimension that we're not quite familiar with. They flip in the air. It's fascinating. It's fantastic. What are they doing? They are neurobio-wiring all the mechanisms they need to have to hunt. Fight. Eh. Mate, no, I will not demonstrate. <laughs> In fact, do you know, speaking of that, rats who, this is going to sound weird, rats who don't play can't copulate correctly. They miss the point, or the hole as the case may be. They don't know how to do it unless they've played. Similarly, just as we see animals, and they're setting up the muscle structures and all that, similarly, we are setting up schemas, muscle structures, physio, endocrine, all those systems through what we call play in developing human competence. The reason you can do what you're doing right now, for those of you who are doing that, and that is called attending to what I'm saying, is because play enthralled you, seduced you into attending at great lengths to this one activity. And it set up the neurobio pattern to be able to attend and focus. People talk about ADHD. It's not necessarily to have a problem with attending. They have a difficulty attending with things they're not interested in. They can hyper-attend to something they're really interested in. And I know there's some newer cases where they can't even do that. I mean, they're all over the place. I've seen those little wonders, too. But for the most part, it's really about how do you attend to something you're not interested in. Play taught you how to do that. So from the simplest thing of how to attend to the most grand thing of abstract reasoning. Well, play is, by definition, abstract reasoning. Because it's a context that's understood to be make-believe. That little pumpkin was able to do that little bathtub because she knew it wasn't a real bathtub. So that's an abstract concept. This is a representation of bathtub. So your ability to abstract reason, whether it's higher order math, philosophy, psychology, because you play. Empathy, yes, bravo for neurons, the neurobiological basis of empathy. But, or and, the way you got to use that first was in play because you really cared about those little figures. They were important. That little, that big hero, yeah, 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 gets the bad guy, the little one got hurt. You're practicing empathy. By the way, animals, know about the context that's understood to be make-believe. As you know, I had three dogs. Mom is Seraphos. Told you about her temperament in terms of her sensitivity quotient. We had Pancake and Blackjack. Well, when Pancake and Blackjack, the most adorable little munchkin puppies, they're golden retrieverish puppies. Oh, God, one's all black, one's all gold. And they would play. I'm taking them out to the Wind Sea Beach and they're playing. And then every once in a while. Oh, they are not playing anymore. Now, foolish me thought, let them work it out. They're little pumpkins. It's kind of, well, it wasn't really cute, but it was kind of. And they seemed to work it out when they were 115 pound dogs in the back of my Jeep, four, three canines, license plate, and they suddenly go, and literally the whole Jeep is shaking. It is not cute, it is not funny, it is freaky. And of course, Seraphos gets into it, and it's interesting, she was the smallest, but she was definitely the, well, she's a alpha, so what, the female, she was definitely the, the queen of the thing. And it, but she was, oh my god, I go out there and yanking them off. 
they wouldn't bite me, but it was really scary. I one time trying to hose them. I mean, it was insane. So yes, we had to get them snipped. And for all men, it's always, my dog's being snipped. Talk about over-identification with the dog. But the vet said, you either snip them, or you're going to come home one day, and there's going to be ears around the room, and they're not going to be attached to your dogs. You have, you cannot let them continue. So I did. They still fought some, but not as much. They know what's make-believe and what isn't make-believe. Kids who don't know that, borderline kids, even though you obviously don't give a diagnosis pre-18, but we know that there are little pumpkins who show those kinds of signs. And one of the things they'll do, for example, in Sam World, I have a, these little um, spiders, little plastic spiders. And they look very real, but they're obviously not. They're plastic. So I open the thing, and the kids will go, and I say, yeah, I know, it looks really real and a little scary to you, but as you see, it's not really real. No. Borderline as a kid will understand it's not real and then lose that boundary and think it's real again. And so the play, it's difficult for them to play in this way because it, they fuse into reality in a sense and they get hyper-elevated, hyper-escalated, unbounded. Can you teach about that through Yeah, I think eventually. Well, it's, a, it's play slash relationship. Because the other thing that's happening is it's, yeah, it's the way to join the child in the world that they really, 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 really live in. You want to be my monic, you play with this little pumpkin. And that's the world they live in. That's what they're connected to. And now you're connected with them. Dear friend of mine, this child, I might have told you this one. I did tell you this one. Believed in fairies. Remember I told you about the one that has fairies? And she had built a little, well, her father built a little fairy house in the backyard. She's about six. And she would put fairy food every night. And of course, the food would always be gone in the morning. And I told you about the fat cats in the neighborhood. But I have a current client who also believes in fairies. And writes notes to the fairies. And she, she believes enough. She kind of knows it probably aren't really, 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 really real, but it's close enough. And she allows herself. She's in that transition. She's about seven, eight into that. So they know, but don't know, but they're able to be flexible about that. Okay. Thoughts, feelings, fantasies, reactions, long definition. Yes? Whose definition is that? Mine. Yeah, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not like, I just dumped everything I could think of. I just kind of started and went, okay, how do I find play? Let me think of every aspect of play. Let me make the simplest definition of play. Because what I don't like about play is the word is we, we've made this into this trivial sounding thing. Oh, go play. Play is, and this is in my, on the first page of my website, play is the child immersed in self-creation. That's what play is. Play is a child immersed in self-creation. And that's why Plato got it right. Life must be lived as play, meaning self-creation. You've got to create yourself. Know thyself. Really, all of psychology is really based on the assumption of how do we really know ourselves. Ergo, how do we really play? Please. You can't hear me. Thank you. Do this one. <laughs> and this is such an important do I'm like, just feeling surprised. Thank you. Play must be lived. I mean, life must be lived as play. It becomes that much more significant if we understand that what play is, is being immersed in self-creation. So life must be lived in self-creation. Exactly. And that's really the fundamental tenet of psychology. How do we live an authentic, ergo, self-creating life? And what stops us, of course, is our fear. Because we've forgotten how to play. And our fear stops us because our fear brings out our perverse protector that tries to protect us in ways that actually harm us. Be it substance abuse, be it suicide. As I said, suicide is the last gasp act of the perverse protector trying to protect you from the beyond agony of feeling so disconnected from everything.
and we will not tolerate that feeling. We would rather be dead. But our perverse protector operates all the time in all kinds of little ways that keep us protected but apart in ways that might not be useful. What's the matter? When you say that, it's just the book. Oh. <laughs> it sounds like so. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I should have, uh, what's that guy's name? Earl Jones? Who did Darth Vader? I should have, it wouldn't be great if I had that voice. Oh, God. I mean, <laughs> life must be lived as play. <laughs> <laughs> but it always bugged me that we have this, you know, play. I'm a play therapist. People are paying me. The parents will say, I'm paying you to play with my kid. Yeah, and then I explain all this. And play really is, you're paying me to help your kid self-create in a way that's bountiful for them so that they flourish. That's what you're paying me for. You betcha. Oh, go play. Oh, go self-create. Doesn't that sound a lot better? I mean, I know it's hokey. And I'm, I'm not pretending I'm going to change the lexicon about play. But if you really think about it. See, every time I see a kid now playing, particularly because, as you know, as much as I love technology, I do think the magic mind is a little bit of an endangered species, given how much we are now screening, how much little pumpkins are screening, and are provided images. It's taking away from the magic mind in certain ways. Anytime I see a kid immersed in software and just playing, I'm like, yes, yes. Remind, let me just add one other thing on that. There is a, and I don't remember exactly the name of the study, there's a study they do every year, internationally, on creativity in children, and they measure it. And last year was the first year ever where the level of creativity, whatever these measures all are, actually was lower than previous years. Is it now, healthy kids? I, I don't, I, you know, I, again, unfortunately, I've eaten so much, and I don't always know exactly what the research is, and I think, Michelle, you asked me about it. Hey, what's the research? Like, some of them, and I'm trying to be better about noting it, because it is, it's nice to have the reference. And sometimes the problem is in a real article, and it references that one. So then I have, you know, it's just like, but, so I don't know, but it was, you know. Now, correlation, causation, who knows? They even, the authors even speculated that it might be due to all this technology infusion into children. So they can't just accommodate, assimilate, do their own thing without having it provided for them. So you had the common question. Right, so you're saying when the parent asks and you say I'm helping the child self-create and I was talking about it the other day with someone, the difference between play and play therapy are significantly different? And we're going to kind of the main thing that's a difference to me really is the relationship. The relationship with the therapist and what happens in that relationship in the context of play. In that sense. It's a little bit like, not exactly, but a little bit like playing guitar on your own or, not versus, playing it with a teacher. A little bit. But I'm not really teaching the child to play better, but I am trying to ex But like, for instance, my, me playing with my little munchkins that I took right. care of, for instance, versus right. me being a therapist playing with a child that is in my office and, you know, I like, I guess I want to have like a foundation for See, I'm look at that differently because I want to specialize with, with like literally like zero to five. I want to work with young kids. I want to do play therapy. And Fantastic. I, obviously, there's no program that's like go become a child psychologist. It's like you need to be a general psychologist, and then you can kind of deal with figuring out how to focus and emphasize. And so for me, this class is like my only thing I have. I'm like, gotcha. Could be everything. Well, but your internship. See, I, I think I told you when I did my internship blocking, I said this is what I want to do. This right. is what I want to do. And I know, again, I think I told you when I got my flamenco guitar in Cordoba, Spain. I don't know if I told you this. So I, get, so I was into flamenco, totally into flamenco. You know, I'm, I, when I went to UC Santa Barbara, I've got the t-shirt in the guitar. I'm in the back of the auditorium, 4,328, 4,329. Because I knew I'd have to do probably 100,000 arpeggios. Boom, da 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 Because in flamenco it's boom, da dum 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 I can't even sing how fast those notes go. Boom, da dum 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 I have a bent bird. I know this seems very tangential. Hang on with me. So it slows me down. I knew it couldn't be a professional guitarist, but I could be a psychologist who plays guitar. You have to practice. You have to practice. You have to spend hours. You want to get great at being with kids? You've got to see a thousand kids, and you're going to be great at it. 
So how in the hell are you going to get a spouse and kids? How many years? It doesn't mean you're not going to be great prior to that. But you've got, I believe, you want to get really good at anything. You've got to practice, practice, practice. Now, what's interesting to me, I do think play, and that's why I teach this class. Remember I said one of the necessities or usefulnesses as a quality of a play therapist is, and nobody ever mentions it, is having a skill. That's why you're spending all this money, hello, to learn some skills. I think there are very useful skills. However, and this is the whole point of filial therapy and a lot of Stalick's work and Gurney's work. You teach these skills to plain old folk, including sixth graders who are going to work with third graders. And you'll see some really good results. It's a bit humbling to highly trained professionals, as you have to pay a bunch of money to, that perhaps maybe there are folks who aren't nearly as trained and don't have all this background of information and theories and all that, and can really tr help transform a little wonder in a certain way of being with them that we call play. <coughs> so I think there's certain ways of being that professionals do in a setting called therapy that you are going to apply with your little munchkins. And I think it's very therapeutic for them that you will engage with them. Mrs. Taylor did tremendous therapy. She changed Linda Berry's life. She never was a therapist. I don't know if she even graduated high school, never mind college. But the way she was, lost art from an ancient tribe, she really listened. She bimonic, she connected, and it changed her life, Linda's life. Good question. Okay, huh. where are we time-wise? Ladies and gentlemen, how are we doing? Ooh, okay, good, we have 15 minutes. Let me give you, let's see, should I go there or should I go there? Let's go there. How do you play in your adult life? What do you do to play in your adult life? I do samba. You do samba, that's fantastic. I play it. Yes. It is addictive. Yes. I'm not addicted to it. Well, you're, you have a passion. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I gave you the definition of the difference from a doping level between passion and addiction, yes? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? that the dopamine will rise before if you're addicted, and it will rise after if it's passion. Yeah, you should learn it. Mine and your hippocampus is how what? <laughs> yes, and you feel pride. I can see you're flushed with pride. It's oh, exactly right. You're, you both, your dopamine goes up both if you think about samba. Even just saying it, your face lights up. No, I know, it's wonderful. I love it. And, and when you're actually doing it, I, I can't even begin to imitate. I have no idea how to do samba. <laughs> I actually learned a few, line, a few moves of tango, which is fantastic. But in any event, when you're actually doing it, your dopamine, so you love it. That's passion. How else do people play? How do you play? Bowling. <laughs> I love it! <laughs> see, do you see how your face lights up? I mean, that, see, you want the um, operalization of play, and it's that look. Now, I know you're changing. Quick, look at her face, quick! Now it's going to change. You get there, that look right there. That's the human species at play. You're like, you're giddy. That's a fantastic space. I really do mean it when I say it is when play is magic mind. It's the magic mind. And it is the magic mind. That will heal, cure cancers. And it will cure, heal the Middle East. It will be the magic mind. In concert with, obviously, the prefrontal cortex. But I'm almost serious when I say if you could get the Middle East leaders under a table in a little teepee kind of thing with blankets over it and get them into their five-year-old giddy, giggly space, you're more likely to have some progress made in these stiff negotiations. I'll see your army and raise you three. Other ways people play. See, and play to me is different than sports. Not that I mean, bowling can be as wonderful. And I could see just in your looks. People have some of these executive types that play. What do you do for recreation? I play tennis. There's, oh my God, golf. Well, that's a real relaxing day. I don't play golf, but I hear people throwing them. They get so mad and they just shot. That's not play. 
Oh my God, that's a challenge of your identity, whether you get the colon one or whatever. Your whole identity gets bad, you know, your sense of value based on whether you did that A slam or not. That is not play. That's challenging your innate sense of inadequacy by trying to compensate, perhaps maybe in some other way. Play with your dope, fantastic. Man, you will go into magic mind, as we well know, and again, at that Nova show. You have got to see that Nova show on Docs. Just Google it and find that show. You will love it, and it will so underscore everything you believe to know to be true about the connection you have with your animal or animals. Um, I usually pick animals for people. Mm -hmm. Oh, you pick animals for people? I won't even ask what animal you have me as being, but that is a great one. You pick animals. I love that. You're like, you're like, you know, say if your boss is freaking you out, imagine him at age five in his underwear. You know, so it's a little bit, you just imagine him as some animal. He's talking, he's like, that's so good. So I'll ask you the cliche question. If you could be any animal, any animal at all, what animal would you be? Oh, I'm a lamb. You're a lamb? Yeah. Wow. I already know this. I got this. You already got this? Love it. What is it about lambness? Um, Describe for us. I hair because it was always curly and poofy. Okay. So. Tell us more if, you, if it's okay with you. A few qualities of being a lamb. Um, I kind of like, I don't know, I kind of frolic around. And, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Some other ways people play. Jen. Okay, but you, I mean, not that that's bad, but like that's wrong. I mean, that's wonderful. But can you do that and, and giggle and have fun and not oh. only get invested in whether you're winning or losing? That's true. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, yeah. I don't know. Okay, we're thinking. And play can be in the simplest ways. My office is on Prospect Street, right? So it's Friday night. And Friday night, or a date night, right? So I, I just was going to my car and I saw, I'm thinking it's kind of a new date situation. Probably not first date. I'm thinking it's like the second or third date. You know, we all do that. Little. And it was just, she's so cute. They're in their, you know, probably 25-ish or maybe very early 30s. Very young people. <laughs> I used to be young like that, I remember. They're in a, one of these little shishi stores and she puts on this hat. And she does this kind of New York model-esque thing. And it was adorable. And he was giggling, and then he put on a hat. You know, they're playing. They're grown-ups on a date with all that dopamine, and they're playing. I'm going to be tangential for one second. I'm sorry that I've made you the superego of the class about tangentialness. And I know you don't want that role, but it's okay. You can, you're very good at handling it. Have you ever read Helen Fisher's book about the biology of love? It's a, it's a wonderful little study. Let me give you it in... 91 seconds, three endocological states. First, dopamine. It's called having a crush. Somebody in, you know, in, the, in the office or something, you, kind of flip, 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 flip. you can't help it, you're like, ooh. I know, silly. In the general progression, it starts with dopamine. You're like, wow, wow, this is cool. And you, now you're starting to date and whatever, wow. And by the way, you really, really, really are more creative. You really are funnier, you're more whimsical, you're more, you really are in those early stages of love. And you think, God, we were so great with each other, we were so, we would laugh and you're dancing down the street, somewhere or otherwise. And it's like, what happened? Next phase usually is, ba boom testosterone, go baby. Sorry, okay, all right, so I ruined it for you, I'm sorry, never mind that. But you can't have sex and all that. You have dopamine, you woo ba -ba boom by the way, this is good for about one year. Our systems can do this for about a year, and then it kind of, we can't keep pumping that same stuff out the same way on a consistent basis, generally. So then comes what you lovely ladies are so great at, and why it is you're better human being than us men. Oxytocin. Bonding, connection, commitment, and vasopressin is, of course, the male version. I will protect you. I'm devoted. So here's the problem. You can have those three different states for three or eight or 18 different people. You might have dopamine going with over here and oh, I'm devoted to you over there. 
That's called a big problem. <laughs> no wonder there's 50% divorce. By the way, a survey, 90% of men say the reason that they cheated on their wives is because they felt... Thank you! Disconnected. I would say it's about 100% for women, it's the way they cheat on their men, overstating it. They feel disconnected. <sighs> play, play brings out that dopamine, that magic mind. Let me give you, before we take a break, the most radical example for me in my own life of utilizing play. Surfing. Oh, no, well, surfing, I mean, that, that's actually it's beyond play for me. Surfing really is a way of being in the world, as I keep saying. It's, it's a whole different thing, but it's also play. I was at St. George Holmes, as you know, residential treatment center for severely disturbed adolescents with a wide spectrum of disorders. And we had, I'll call her Martha. She was 17 and a half. She was African American. She was a poet. I mean, she was a poet. She was very large, by the way. She was large and a poet. And I, as you know, I'm a guitarist. So, and she, I was the head resident of the home she was in. And so we would do music. She would write words and I would come up with melodies and it was really cool. She also had a horrifically dangerous dark side. And you'd always know where we come, because you'd walk in the room <laughs> and she had that, <laughs> almost as if she had drinking something, like she was drunk. <laughs> and her eyes were, I yeah, did pretty well. Her eyes were, were um, a little dilated and a little, and then she'd get this, I swear to God, demonic look. And, because she had learned to know, once she's doing that, <laughs> oh, it's coming, the volcano is coming. She would come up to people in the day center and bite them in the cheek. Mm -hmm. She nearly killed me. We were in the mountains of Northern California living the life of the Plains Indian because they are living the magic mind. Native American, sorry, Plains Native American. So we have Earth Society and all these different societies. And we, I mean, we really did this. And they did much better up there than they did in Berkeley, California. They acclimated to that world. Well, she won this power object, which was a rock that looked like an extended tomahawk, basically. I was a head reticent. I have the last call on that. She talked me into it. She made a sacred area in her room, now back at Berkeley, with this rock and whatnot. <laughs> she went into one of those states. I was the only one with her at that time. She threw me on the bed, and she was about to crush my head with this object. She was in a total altered state. And I really thought, wow, I was born in Israel, and I died in Berkeley. How strange. And everything goes very slow motion when you think you might die. Not to be over dramatic, but I couldn't figure out how I was going to get out of this. I thought, well, maybe if I do this, I'll at least just break those two and they'll come into my head. I mean, and this is going because you were going so fast in your mind. Way back when, when I smoked a little dope, I probably shouldn't say this on camera, but who cares? Way back. It really was way back. <laughs> I remember things going very slow and all that. Well, all right, so she's really about to impale me. Thank God, Steve Haskett, thank you for saying life, comes into the room. And he pushes her out of the way just as she throws the rock. And I go like this, and the rock puts a huge oh. hole. Bless you, twice, once, right where my head was. Actually, he came in, she put the rock down for a moment, and then she threw it. I, I mean, there's another thing I remember thinking, oh, I had this image of being in the Berkeley Gazette, not on the front page, but like on page three somehow. Counselor dies in pain. So, to set the stage, we had a conflictual relationship at time. I got up and said, don't ever do that again. I cannot be with you right now. I understand how upset you were. Boy, talk about shifting fear. She is once now consolidated about a month or two later. She is at the day center thing. She runs home. I'm the head resident. I'm running after her. She's now in the kitchen. She is about to set the curtains on fire in the kitchen. <laughs> hmm. Okay. It's me, it's her, she's looking in, she's about to do that. 
I have no idea what to do. I happen to notice I'm by a fridge. I go, wait one moment. Just before you set the whole house on fire, just wait one sec. Just hang on. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Here, let me just hang on. Just let me get close. I'm not going to take away your match. One, two, three, four, five, six. Eggs. I have six, you have six. Go! Bam! Bam! I started throwing eggs at her. She was like, oh wow, this is beef burning the house down. This is really fun. And she started throwing eggs back. And we looked like walking eggs Benedict. We were just dripping in eggs. And we were laughing. And we were scratching each other's hair and going, wow, man, protein shampoo, protein shampoo. Let's go shampoo our hair. Play changes your brain state to a playful one where you feel connected to others and self and world and you're open and you're creative. That same dopamine that gets you giddy while you're in love and you're so witty. Witty and witty and wise or whatever that song is. Where's that from? West Side Story. I feel pretty. Well, that's dopamine. She's on dopamine. That's what play does for you. Okay. Thoughts, feelings, fancies before we take a quick break? Reactions? Ready to go. Play for a little 15 minutes or take a little break. What time is it? Should be about 10. It is! It's exactly 10 o'clock, at least by this clock. Come back at 10.15. No later, please. Ciao. Now, let me see. Okay, we are back. We are back. We are back. <coughs> We're sort of back. We're getting back. We are back. We're, We're totally back. Okay. Okay. A couple more things about play. The causative mind, one of our gifts is our ability to predict and do a cause and effect. If, this, if I do this, this will happen. Or that will happen. How does the world work? Let's see. If I turn this off, oh, the lights go off. I push this up, it goes on. Oh. Play is integral to developing the causative mind. Causative? Yeah. The causation, the learning of how to cause, what causes what. And if you watch kids, it's really interesting. I, when I watch kids really immerse in play, I, I'm almost like seeing the myelination that's happening, the connections between brain areas, the pruning. You can see it happening. They're figuring out. They're really deeply immersed in this activity. And they're figuring out how things work. It's really important. And the other part of play that's also very important. We are the storytelling people. We're narrative species. We're a narrative species. In fact, it really is what our, is unique about us. We frame our lives as stories. In fact, it's strange to me sometimes, events, you know, like in December I go with my son to Hawaii, right, to watch the Pipe Masters. But once an event happens, it's almost like a photo, like a card. And almost the order of it doesn't matter anymore. Whether I was at St. George Holmes, and then I did this, and then I went to Cotillon, and then I... These are just events that I can almost shuffle up in different things. Because they're just stories, they're framed in this way that's almost separate from the timeless. And play teaches us to tell the story. Play is the Rembrandt of the soul. Words for a three-year-old and five-year-old. I think I'm giving it. It's like you have a drawing of this room, you know, where they used to do drawings about emergency exit and how you leave and whatnot. Well, that is a, if we had that, the usually in the doorways. That would be a very distant representation of this room. If we had Rembrandt paint this room, it'd be a much more accurate representation of this room. It still wouldn't be the room, oh, by the way. But we might even be able to see things in the painting that we wouldn't in our own mind just see about this room. Play, in a way, is like the Rembrandt of the soul of the child. It tells us in this orbital frontal lobe, amphrey frontal way how this child experiences life. Play also has the property of drag and drop. That is, you take from one 
type of experience and you drag that ability to another type of experience. The famous line on that one, and even your generation probably knows this, wax on, wax off. Everybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Karate Kid, the very first one. Famous scene. God, right, that's a drag and drop. You're going to practice this. Why am I having to wax on, wax off your backyard? It's child labor laws. Because you're practicing your blocks. But the kid is practicing. When the kid is being heroic, identifying with that aggressive one and whatnot, he is forming the neurobioendocrophysio template of empowerment. So that you, when you go, when you go to present your alls, when you go do that test, I want your inner Zena to come out like, I've got something to tell you folks. I've been doing this research. It didn't come out exactly as I thought, but I've got some things to say. <sighs> I am a woman, hear me roar. You're able to do that because you played at being competent and strong. You played at being weak and scared. You played at being nurturing and sensitive. You created these ways, and then you take that and you drag it into your real life. Way back when, in their 15 minutes of fame, maybe they were 30 minutes, the guy named Van Richard Bandler, Richard Gindler, Bandler and Grindler wrote this series of books called The Structure of Magic. They followed Virginia Satir and Milton Erickson and tried to figure out what they were doing and what they're doing in many ways is taking traits and qualities and attributes from one <coughs> domain and transforming into another domain. Milton Erickson knew that you had that sense when you first took your first step of like, oh my God, am I masterful? I can do anything. And he knew you still had that. How do I reawaken that? How do I get that aspect of yourself, that part of you, in contact? Who do you want to be in this moment, that part of you? How do I do that? I went to a workshop with Bandler and Grindler, and they had a woman there who had a very hard time dieting and whatnot. But she was an incredible, she was a banker and very good at money. So they had her talk about how she handles money, and they, they call it anchoring, they touch her on one side. Then they have her talk about how she doesn't manage her diet, they touch her on another side. Then they have her talk about how she doesn't manage her diet, but touch her on the banking part, and they're transferring over that ability to Use what you need, not what you don't, all that stuff. From the banking into the dieting. And at least in that case, it worked. And those are the ones that don't. Play as a drag and drop. All those experiences. Okay. Let me give you a couple of other things, that, examples of play. Um, did you know that? If you ask a child to stand still, the average child, and not move, and you're in Buckingham Palace, Go ahead and try and make me laugh. They're good for about three minutes. If you tell them you're at Buckingham Palace and you're the guard, the average child can last seven minutes. Same exact activity, just standing still, looking straight ahead. You can blink every once in a while. You frame it as play at more than twice the capacity. Please. My other sister is 13 years younger than me, and when she was little, we used to have her play that game with called Stump to see how long she could sit like a tree stump just to give her a shut up. That's good. It's funny. It doesn't work a lot better. Yeah. 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 You form it as play, it's unbelievable. At St. George Holmes, we had one young adult, he was like 20 some odd, and because he was a friend of Dorothea, De Fear was the matriarch and owned St. George Holmes. She allowed him to stay. He was paranoid schizophrenic. And you walk down the street with, we'll call him Bob, walk down the street with Bob, and one of the things he noticed is how the cars, the grills on the cars were growling at him. And he had the, the eyes, the headlights were the eyes. And the weird thing is you walk in and you kind of go, you know, they are kind of a little spooky looking. I was, I was close to Bob. <clears throat> he would stand at a doorway and he had that look. And I'd go over, I'd say, Bob, don't worry, just, just move aside a second. And I'd open the door and go, get out of here! And close the door. And I look at him and he's giggling. He's like, come on. That's his sanest moment. When he can giggle at how ridiculous it is that he's assuming that somebody out there is about to get him. The other thing sometimes I would do, I know this sounds so bizarre. Okay, let me just oh. He would stand, he would stand, oh, I want to hear him just one second. He would stand 
And as I look, and I would I'd just come by him and go, don't move. Ha! I got him. And he would laugh. I mean, it's ridiculous. I'm being crazier than he is. In that moment, he's playing. I'm playing. We're playing. He's laughing. He's sane in that moment. You have a comment? Oh, I was just thinking about the movie It's Over Inside Patch Adams. I was just Oh, yeah. There's a scene where the patient is afraid of being of spiders. Yeah. And he started playing like he's killing them and all this scene, and that's how it gets to the bathroom. And they were playing. You betcha. Yeah, that's exactly what I was just thinking. You betcha. I don't like heights. Oh, I, I don't, I, you know, I'm in a building, I'm looking out, I don't care about that. It's, I don't want to fall. It's crashing to the ground I don't like. Okay, so my wife and my son are skiers. Well, my son's a snowboarder. Ugh. So I'm on the mountain. Ugh. I, I've never felt so humbled. It's wonderful. There's a 92-year-old woman, she must have been 92, zipping past me. You know, I'm doing the, I'm mostly doing pizza. A little bit of french fries. Ah, pizza. And there's a little two-year-old zipping past like, okay, great. I love to find this area where I'm utterly incompetent. Even though I look the part, I got the matching red thing. I look like, you know, oh, fuck. Anyway, the point of all this is, so when I'm on the, oh, my God. I mean, it's all kind of, the worst part of skiing for me is going on this lift. Oh, my God. You're 30 feet off the ground. Now you're 40 feet off the ground. And it's always the highest point where, oh, it's all of a sudden stopped. Oh, feel the breeze. Oh, isn't this delightful? Oh, my God. It is the anti-Zen. How to not be here now. Because this is the last place in the planet I want to be. Is up here. And it's like, oh, God. Talk about the blind leading the blind. My sister-in-law is worse than I am. And somehow we ended up on a thing together. And if they fucking stop, there's a ridge like this. And she's, I could see she's just, I mean, sheet white. She's just three synapses away from a total panic attack. They have to send a helicopter to pick her up. I mean, it's like, and all I said to her is, Michelle, because I thought, the blind's leading the blind. This is ridiculous. I said, talk to me about Chelsea's birth. Huh? Chelsea's birth, right? One of the greatest moments of your life? Yeah. And so she's talking about Chelsea's birth, and then things started to move. She was like, oh, God. <laughs> We're getting closer. I would count the number of posts until you get to the landing pad thing, safety at last. And of course, I'm the last one to lift the thing up. And everybody's trying to lift, no, can't lift it up yet. They're like, no, just wait, okay, now. I mean, it's absurd, it was absurd. Even now, I'm getting icy. And then I remember one time on the little, and this is a little bunny slope ones. And I have a little kid next to me. They're, you know, they want to, here, would you take this kid? Oh, God, I'm getting so. And of course, the little pumpkin's like, do we have to put the, yeah, we're gonna put the bar down. <laughs> would you help me with my mittens? Oh, fuck, I gotta let go of the bar. <laughs> no, I swear to God, I'm like, I'm panicked. I'm like, can I do this with one hand? And I thought, oh, God. And I'm trying to, like, there we go. Can you lean back a little, honey? Okay. Can we put the bar up? Not yet. I mean, they like they want, but I'm like, not yet. They're like, dude. I'm like, okay, now. I mean, pathetic. Beyond pathetic. My kid is now, we're, it's, he's eight years old. He's been doing it since he's five. I mean, he's doing, he even did a black by there. He's, Dad, can you meet us for lunch at the top of the hill? Please, I will do Anything for Duran Balkani. I will do anything. Sure. Oh, fuck. How am, I gonna, how am I gonna do this? Can we snowmobile up there? How am I going to do this? Because that means I have to take the big lift and the whole thing, totally other terrain. Oh my God. I'll do anything for my son. But with a whole bunch of PR friends, our tribe, as I call them, they're all gonna meet up there. Okay. So this is um, North Star up in Tahoe. The good news is they have a gondola that goes, leads you to the area where you then take these big things. Okay, there's a point to all this, I hang with me. I thought, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do implosive therapy, I can do this. Everybody's gone, because now it's kind of midday, I don't have to meet them until like one. It's noon, there's nobody on these gondolas. I get in this gondola, okay, it's closed, I don't have a problem. There's nobody around. I force myself to look over, again, it's enclosed, I look over, and this is the mantra. I am a hawk. Height is beautiful. I am a hawk. Height is beautiful. I swear to God, I did that all the way up. Got in, came all the way down. No, I'm not leaving. I just need, okay, sir, go ahead. 
Oh, oh, this beer. I mean, I'm giggling. It's insane. Anybody sees me, it's the men in white. I wouldn't be teaching this class. I mean, it's insane. I did that three times over the whole time. I got off that third time. Oh, the inner hawk is soaring. I get on that fucking lift. I get on, put it down. Of course, there's these cool snowboarders. It's like, oh, man, do we really have to put this down? Please, thank you. I'm a hawk. Hi, this is beautiful. Just don't stop. Please don't stop. And it didn't. It went all the way to the top. Had lunch. Everybody's stuck. And then, oh, my God, how do I get down? I have no pride. I have no problem walking down the mountain with my skis as if this run is too slow for me. True stories. Play in the service of changing schemes. By the way, I don't have much problem anymore with ski lifts. It's amazing to me. I can sit up there, I look down, I see people going by. Hi, honey, there's my kids zipping by. And I don't, I mean, I still like the bar down. I'm not a bar upper, I still like the bar down. And I still don't like it when it, we have to, the last time I was on ski lift, with my honey poo, you know, I, I used to do it with teachers, and I always say just talking to the entire time. Now, you know, we're, we're, and all of a sudden, sure enough, it stopped. And I thought, let me guess. Oh, yeah, the highest point. But I can do this. I don't count the posts anymore. I still am a little slow to do the thing, but I'm, it, I'm really healed. I'm really very different. It's exhausting to watch me ski because all I want to do is not get hurt. If I got hurt so I couldn't surf or do karate because of skiing, oh, I'm so I just turn a lot. I've learned to turn a lot. Anyway, height is beautiful. You can transform who you are through play. Let's talk about humanistic psychology. Humanistic psychology. Now why they got to the term that you use the term humanistic? What are the rest? Atavistic? Non-humanistic? But somehow they got to use the term humanistic. The point is, play makes the context safe enough to risk becoming who you are. Safe enough to risk becoming who you are. Humanistic psychology, any theory we're going to put through this grid. Theory of the person. We all have a theory of the person. And it kind of comes down to, we're fundamentally bad cauldron of evil impulses, whatever, that we have to tame. We're neutral, uh, that'd be the psychoanalytic, overstating, oversimplifying, but basically we're a cauldron of CD impulses that we have to contain. And, or, you're kind of a blank slate, tabula rasa, whatever, the old social learning theory, come into you know, reinforcers determine kind of who you are. Or, we're good. You, all of you believe in a fundamental not prefrontal cortex, but an orbital frontal lobe, fundamental feeling sense. You have a sense of whether we're fundamentally good, fundamentally bad, or neither. And it's almost impossible to talk you out of it. No matter how much research I cite for you to try and prove to you a certain position, and you well know what my position would be. And I, have, I have books and books to prove we really are this way. If you don't believe that, and I could be wrong, most theories could be wrong, no way I'm going to talk you into it. So all theories have a theory of pathology, if you're dealing with psychology. All theories have a, th a theory about healing and what the therapist's role is. And then you like certain things and eh, not so hard about other things, about any and all theories. So that's going to be our grid. By the way, ooh, not to bring up anxiety, on the final, I told you, I will have a question that will contribute to your final. Thank you, bosses. And that will be, we're going to take all the, I'm going to say, put the theories that we learned, humanistic, psychoanalytic, um, Jungian, through this grid. And most importantly, what's your theory of the person, of pathology, of what heals? What do you like and not like about your theory? So what's the basic the premise, assumptions? What's it all about, Alfie, for humanistic psychology? In terms of theory of the person. Inherently. You betcha, sweet bippy baby. Did you know that an 18-month-old infant, well, toddler, 18 months, if they're told that in opening a box, even though there's something interesting in it, it will hurt another child, most all 18-month-olds won't open the box. And there's nothing about it. you're going to get punished if you do. There's nothing to do with that. We are 
wired to be good. Whatever we mean by that, kind, caring, all that stuff. And what interferes is fear. I'm not saying we're always good, obviously we're not. But the fundamental assumption of the person is we are fundamentally good if our psychological needs are met. Remember Maslow and the hierarchies and whatnot? If we feel psychologically safe, i.e. we're not in fear. Our nature is such that we'll be kind, caring, empathic. Mirror neurons, for God's sakes. And thank you, Ramachandran, that if my arm's numb, I not only metaphorically feel your pain, I literally feel your pain. You go, ow, ow, and I'm actually going to go, ow, ow. Unbelievable. What motivates us? Remember Maslow's? What's the highest need or motivator? The top of the pyramid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Sorry for the... Um, Socratic method here. Self-actualization. It's about being all that you can be. We have a longing to be all that we can be. We strive, as long as these other needs are met. We're fundamentally good when we're, when we're safe. We strive to be all we can be. And let me give you another one. Well, let me actually stop here for a second. This is, so to Carl, this is in the 50s. Right? Carl comes along, I think he's, I think he graduated in like 48 guys, PhD, something like that. So early 50s, the zeitgeist is of course, and, and nothing wrong with it, but it's of course very fundamental psychoanalytic. I mean, that's by far. And we'll talk, I mean, Siggy was a genius, no question about it. He was an unbelievably brave man in all kinds of ways. Maybe he was narcissistic too, whatever, and he did cocaine. But other than that, he was brilliant. Well, Carl comes along when it's very in blank slate kind of approach, psychoanalytic approach in those days. It was very blank slate. It's not Siggy taking vacations with his patients, as he would call it. And here comes Carl, human being, genuine. I thou, that's radical stuff. Okay? So there's a guy named White. I think it was Robert White who, in the early 50s, writes an article about another motivator. Now, I think I told you, I told you about Ryer, the psychoanalytic guy. I didn't tell you this. So Joe Ryer was a psychoanalytic guy in uh, Michigan State. And he had a client who climbed a mountain, I'll tell you this, and he climbed it to the top, and he had this impulse to eat the snow. And Ryer assumption was what motivated him. Do you have any idea what motivated his client? He's psychoanalytic. To climb this mountain and eat the snow? Thirsty. That'd be good. That'd be a good survival mode. No, it's obviously his mother's breast. And obviously the snow is her cold milk and he wants to somehow suck on his mother. Now, I'm not saying that's not also true. Remember I told you every theory is also true? White would have a different interpretation. I know if it was a bimodal distribution, you'd catch the breast part easier, but nonetheless. So Wright writes this article that another human motive is called the competence. See, drive or motive or whatever, competence. In those days, that's a radical assumption. He would have said he climbed the mountain because he had a longing to feel competent. Every time I catch this thing, I feel that. Right there, I got a little dopamine hit. Yes! And guess what? The harder it is, Oh, it would have been better with one hand. Yes! Oops, sorry. Yes! It is wired in the bioplasm of our being to be competent, to use whatever skills we have in whatever small little way. And men's neuromurons are so focused on competence. And you know, you've already been told this, when they're watching the Chargers or whatever their favorite team is, and they're winning, yeah! Their testosterone levels are soaring. Never mind their dopamine and all that. Don't talk to me. Just don't even talk. Just, I'm never going to watch them again. Turn off the TV. When they lose, their testosterone's dropping. And whatnot. Our mirror neurons are soaring towards competence. But you're all oriented towards competence. That's a very deep motive. Now, of course, my assumption, as you might imagine, would be that underneath this, now this is actually secondary to Yes, that when you are competent, oh, and it's so disappointing 
and then say, I want to do it again, and do it so I catch it. But I'll wait. But you're more accepted. You're more connected. Others like, come on, what did we just have two weeks ago? The Academy Awards! What's happening this summer? The Olympics! What's the most watched thing on the planet? No, it's not the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is number two or three. Do you know what is the most watched thing? It's like eight billion people will watch this. No, how many? There's only six billion on the planet. So I guess two billion from space are also watching. Is it six billion on the planet? I can't remember. Six point five? I think so. It's, it's what? It's higher now, it's like seven now. Oh, okay, thanks. So what is it that's watched more than anything else? The World Soccer Cup. Soccer is by far the most popular sport. There's, there's more over a billion people watching it. Oh, I love that look like it's, stuff. It's funny, it's like American and we do soccer differently. Yeah. Really. Oh, it's huge. I mean, people will kill for it. It's insane. As you know. But anyway. But what is that? So it's cop so it's if we are competent, oh my God. We are adored. We are loved. We are never disconnected. It's the associative response way inside here. Mm. So I think underlying our longing for competence. Never mind, it also feels really good to catch this. And even if you do it alone in a room where nobody's watching, you'd rather catch it than not. I mean, it makes sense. It got us out of the trees and it's wonderful to be competent. But I think underneath it, it's also, I will then be admired, ergo connected. If I'm not competent, I'll be rejected. These are radical assumptions. So given that we're fundamentally good and all that, what is pathology about? I mean, Roger worked with people who had existential angst. Felt alone. Felt inadequate, incompetent, all that stuff. Bad about themselves. Anxiety. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What causes pathology in this world view? Correct. And what might have gotten in the way? Very good. Again, apologize for the Socratic method, but... Caregiver, the way the caregiver cared or didn't care. Or Perfect. <clears throat> Perfect. You want to add to that? Or so? I was going to say they're, they're not valued or valued. Exactly. When you don't have this, you disavow aspects of yourself. Because it doesn't go away. When you're told, you don't hate your brother, what are you talking about? You, we don't use that word hate in this household. That's not an okay word. I hate the word hate. A paradox there, but in any event. And you don't hate your brother, you love him. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Totally changed my feelings. You're right. I love my little brother, Bosco. Here, Bosco. <laughs> now don't forget, don't forget about prosody, right? It doesn't have to be the words. It's all in the tone and the look and all that. Don't forget that we notice a change in facial expression in one three hundredth of a millisecond. You're picking up unbelievable cues, mirror neurons and all that other stuff. And you know how everybody's family feeling about what it is you're feeling about. And when you get the message that what you're feeling is not okay and your little pumpkin, your feeling is your being. You don't differentiate between that. Ergo, you, you split off aspects of self. Like that you hate your little brother. Ergo, you become, quote, self-alienated by definition. You're not connected with yourself. This is not a unimonic state. Aspects of self bad. I think I told you this wonderful movie, Something Memories, by Woody Allen. Star something memories. Anyway, well, he's chasing his anger. <laughs> he's got this little white safari hat. He's in the jungle. And he's chasing his anger, which is this big ape. At least he's going after this dissociated aspect of self, his anger. And when you dis do that, you're going to feel bad. You're going to feel anxious. You're going to feel depressed. You're going to feel that kind of ennui, no joy, ahedonic. And what's it all about, Alpha? You're going to feel meaningless, pointless, all that stuff we struggle with. Again, this is all oversimplified. Volumes of books and all this. But it's basically the central assumption. So of course, tautologically, what's the cure? How does this work? Right, and what's their, since they don't really use the V squared term per se, what's their term for it? Reunify with aspects of yourself or the disconnect? <laughs> Correct, and the ambiance. I okay, You betcha. I'd add one other word to that and that is genuine. 
Unconditional positive regard. Gupper. To catch up with you. Oh, is that anything new? No. Okay. You can keep going. We were just saying, so self-alienation comes from when disavowed aspect of self. And the healing comes from genuine, unconditional, positive regard. In this moment, in this I-thou moment, as you truly feel valued and validated for truly any thought, feeling, fancy reaction, any state of being, you will re-own that aspect. And you will be, in my term, unimonic and you will feel whole, and you won't feel anxious in that moment, and you won't feel angry. You feel at peace. It's got to be genuine. Okay? So, what do you like? What do you think? Hey, I don't know. Are we on time? It's difficult with a person that has, like, schizophrenia, like a high level of pathology for them, their cognitive process is not in fact. So well said. As a matter of fact, dear Carl, who was, I guess, the first, I think, with the card sort system to do actual outcome research. And he did it while he was working in an inpatient unit with schizophrenics. And he said, it doesn't heal schizophrenia. Damn good way of being with them, but it's not going to heal them in and of itself. Yay for his genuineness. It's still a wonderful way to be with anybody, duh, yeah, but it's not going to heal. Yes, there's neurobiological, as we keep saying, we keep discovering more and more and more and more and more. There are neurobiological bases to things. That, and, and as we know from plasticity, it doesn't mean the relationships can't be changed in neurobio. They can, but only up to some point, some time. Neurobio stuff that might not be able to be immediately or ever ameliorated merely by an I thou. And yeah, your attitude and all kinds of things can determine whether you survive or don't survive cancer, which is really biologically based, but not all gen people die of cancer, no matter how positive they are, how much they're being loved, how much imagery, medicine, everything else. I got it. You have a thought or comment? It made me think of the story you told about um the girl who was about to set the curtains on fire. Yeah. And you, you were sort of genuine with her, and it, even in that severe, you know, she was under the control, if you will, of that severe pathology. You were able to even just in that moment bring her out of that, and do you know what I mean? So yeah. It, 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 it's a good way of being with someone, even someone who was absolutely. I did not cure Bob's paranoid schizophrenia. But in that moment, when he and I could laugh about my squishing an invisible thing that he knew was in it, I mean, I was being ludicrous, or in that existential here that we're in a bimonic, we're, we care about it, and we're having a good, it's good. If he can bring out the play in anybody, in couples, I can to play instead of, I mean, again, remember these bi-reciprocal relationships, we're getting these patterns, and some of them are really negative patterns. And the fact they've been with each other for 25 years isn't a positive necessarily, because they have 25 years of habitual negative pattern. I, what is it, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, the famous play? They had a bi-reciprocal relationship. It was awful. But if you can move into play, it changes it. So, so, so on the one hand, one of the nice things is you can change in this existential moment and second. In this second. You can change. In parentheses, they believe maybe in certain ways forever. Maybe you can, they don't use this language, but change the schema of the self. Remember I talked about the self schema, that's the yum yuck continuum? That maybe in this context of this relationship where you feel valued and validated through being reflexively reflected, genuinely, unconditionally regarded, koala lu, oh how I so love you. I always have and I always will. Whether you win the Olympics or not, we change how we feel about ourselves. So it's optimistic. That's another thing. What's uh, what other things you like or don't like? Um, I think it's just generally a really good theory for being able to connect with your client, or yeah. no matter what age they are. It's just a good way of connection. That's nice. Right. Well, it's. Plus to connect. What's this? This is um, right before the connect. Optimistic. 
It is a very optimistic, I mean, it's a marvelously optimistic point of view about the human species. We're good, we want to do the best we can, all that other stuff. Again, there's all kinds of research in social biology about that will to care about others. We are so much more caring than we are bad. <laughs> um, and even our badness tends to usually be out of a longing to connect in another way. It's ahistorical in some sense, and that one could say is both good and bad. Whereas, when I invited a psychoanalyst up here once many years ago, he talked about doing, I think it was four or five sessions with the parents first before they even saw the child to get all the history. I mean, I think that's on one hand marvelous. They're very historical. They want to know all the different stages and whatnot. Rogers is here now. Humanism is here now. That's all that matters. It's right here, right now. How do you feel about that right here, right now? Now, you might bring in history and whatnot, but you don't really... It's not that you don't care, but you don't do a huge historical thing. It's here now. I'm going to be with you right here, right now. Yeah? For a negative, I, I feel like you have to have some, the client has to have some capacity for empathy, or some, like, they need to be uh, reinforced by a relationship. Well, again, there's no question that this, this does not, no therapy works on everybody, no question. But, Sociopaths. Oh, yeah. But sociopaths clearly have a neurobio. Now, again, an ultimate dream would say it. Empathizing is in the empathize Z, not the empathizer. I can try and empathize best I can. I still can believe in principle. If I could ever reach those billion unspent tears of disconnection deep inside of you by my genuine care for you, then you would experience this co empathy and you would change. The and they would even say, and I would change your neurobiology. Well, that probably isn't true. I, I don't ultimately know. I will say this. I, I told you I, I um, evaluate, I evaluate two murderers. I don't know if I told you that, but I have. I don't do that work anymore. The weird thing is, the first one, first one was a team. Did I tell you this? I'm sorry if I, I don't want to go into the hook because I want to make sure we get into other things. But basically, he murdered a friend's wife, a friend's mother. The short of it is, and I'll tell you at some point if it's of interest, more specifics, but the short of it is, I actually had empathy for him as to why he did it and how he was set up. His father would take him, he had braces, smash him in the mouth, and put his bloody face in the mirror and say, see what happens when you fuck with me? Well, little wonder this guy ended up butchering and did all kinds of things, and they had this imagery of blood coming out of mouths, and he's just going to have empathy for this guy. The other one was a mother who killed her baby. I never could get to the point of empathy for her. So I can't be genuinely, unconditionally positive regarding to every human being. Sorry, I'm flawed and foibled. I can't. It's hard. I'm my issue, not theirs. But that's a very zen. That's a very grand. Um, they kind of have one treatment fits all. And some could say that's a problem. You kind of do the same thing for everybody. They don't have a lot of Differential diagnosis. So I had, when I was doing my postdoc at CMH, KD Francesca as a supervisor, who's a marvelous diagnostician clinician. She worked a lot in the prison systems. Very good at MMPIs and Rorschachs, and that's what I had her for. And right after her, I had Barry, oh God, what, not Barry White, Barry, mm, I can't remember his name. He was a real, honest to God, humanist, core to core. Core to core, studied with Rogers. Again, Rogers was right here at Western Medical Science Institute, or studied for the center of the person. And so he, Barry Ill come to me. Great guy. What you realize with Barry, I mean, it was so weird because he was really genuine and really right present with everybody when he's with them. And first, it's a little almost creepy. And then you realize it, he's really, really, really like that. And that's kind of cool. I mean, he's really relating to you. Wow. And what was Barry's diagnosis for any and every client he saw? What do you think? What was his diagnosis? I'll tell you, it was only one diagnosis. Adjustment. Human being. I'll diagnose you. You're a human being. <laughs> I think you're a human being. You know, you're a human being too. That was his, and he's made it very clear. That's the only diagnosis I'll ever give anybody. You're a human being. 
He obviously practiced before managed health care. Correct. <laughs> Doesn't take insurance. I think he's still around. Human being. So again, there's a positive and a negative to that. But God knows it's consistent with the theory. I mean, borderline? What the hell is that? I mean, I do understand what that means, and I do understand the value of diagnosing and all that. I mean, I understand the argument for that. I'm not taking a position one way. I mostly give the adjustment reaction diagnosis. It tends to be correct in some way while adjusting something. Insurance will pay, and you can still run for president. I told you about Eagleton. But Barry would diagnose everybody human being. So there's a positive to that, there's a negative to that. Okay, I want to keep moving. Ah, time! We can do more on this, but I want to get to the next thing. At least it gets you thinking. And there's readings you can do. There's some readings there, and there's other readings. Everywhere. You Google humanistic therapy. But I want to get to the application of this with our little pumpkins. We talked about your task is to create a psychologically safe environment in this I thou relationship through being reflexively reflecting and valuing and validating, being a tradeologist. What is this? No wrong answers. I'm sorry, what? An egg. An egg. Okay, good. I'll go with that. Bop, bop, bop. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Circle, it's fine. Pizza, I don't care. What? Anything. What? A ring. Okay. Yeah, a ring. The point of that is it's whatever you decide it to be. You're going to be a humanistic therapist? That's up to you in here. The child decides what reality is. Now, I'm, what I'm going to be espousing for the next 15 minutes, or less actually, because then I want to show you. Am I going to get to this? Ugh. Is a purest version. I don't do this purest version, as you will see, but I want to give you the purest version. I know, and I'm not even sure. Actually, we're going to get to one of the exercises. I'm not sure we're going to get to the end of it, but at least we'll get to do one of the exercises. She especially came back because I told her we'd get to this thing. So we talked about humanistic. I said, well, then we just started with the play therapy. The child defines reality in that room. You're not there to be a teacher to teach them about reality. You are there to value and validate who they are so that they can re-own the disavowed self, so that they can naturally bloom because that's what they're wired to do if they feel psychologically safe. And symptoms in this motif are the result of feeling unsafe. So if, I, if you feel safe in here, you will bloom. Okay? So you can think, feel, say anything, do just about anything. You're the boss in here. That's up to you in here. And I've added the tradeologist part, and that will serve you well in life, is my other favorite saying. Okay. So I sat around, again, like I made this ridiculous definition of play, I thought, oh, so how do we actually do that? And here's what I've come up with. So here's the behavioral operalization. Perfect timing on your part for coming in. The behavioral operalization of the humanistic method. But first, just to get us in, in the mood and in the context, I'm going to have you this. You're going to pair up. So I think we're all, everybody's paired but you, so you're going to join them. So we've got two, two, two. Everybody pair up. You're going to be okay, trust me. You're going to be okay. Pair with her, Melissa. Come on, come on, look at each other. You're going to be okay. So here's what you're going to do. Here's what you're going to do. This is going to be the most ludicrous, ridiculous thing you've ever done in your graduate school career. I've already warned you about this. I already told you we're going to do this, and we are. I want you to be little puppies for an excruciating 15 full seconds. When you say puppies, you literally mean puppies? Yes. I call children puppies. No, I want you to be puppies. I want you to be a puppy. <laughs> for 15 seconds. You can do this. Can we be a cat for a cat first? Next time. I mean, next thing's going to be cats. Oh, okay. Come on, 15 seconds. Puppies, let's go. Come on. <laughs> okay, very good. Good boy. Here, boy. Here, girls. Come on. Here, girls. It's a, hard, it's, it's a little hard to move out of that space, isn't it, once you get in it? Huh? 
I mean, just look at your faces, right? Ah, the magic mind. Okay, now, just for 15, oh God, just for 15 seconds, be kitties. Meow. <laughs> Okay, that's probably less than 15 seconds, but you get the idea. Now, one of you is a puppy, or two of you are puppies, and one of you is a kitty. 15 seconds. And just, you be cat, you be dog. Just work out real quickly. All right. Perfect. Perfect. And so why did I make you do that? Exactly, duh, yeah. If we had fMRIs on your marvelous magic minds, we'd see you're in your orbital frontal limbic lobe areas and not much prefrontal. And prefrontal is magic and wonderful in its own way. You can be with kids, you're going to spend a lot of time in the I'm out mind. You are, and you need to be facile at that. You need to be able to go, like I was saying, I think Aristotle's might have gotten it wrong. <laughs> you gotta be, you're gonna be with kids, you gotta move in and out of that world. And by the way, they will love you for it. That's why it's better than going to Disneyland. They hang with somebody who goes, <laughs> and yet is kind and caring and sensitive and big, will be attuned to and resonate with your thoughts, feelings, fans, perceptions, and states of being. Okay, so here we go. We're going to operationalize what it is if you are a mirror with heart. Oh, by the way, that's the role of therapist. I left that one out. You are a mirror with heart. Because you mirror back to the child in a genuine, heartfelt way where they're coming from, what their worldview is. Thoughts, feelings, fantasies, perceptions, ways of being, etc. So here is what it is you, in fact, mirror. Duh. Well, the first thing you're going to mirror is motor behavior. Huh? That's so ridiculously simple. I see you're pulling that. I see you're putting those here. I see you're looking at me. You do that to adult for more than 3.8 seconds, and they're likely to call the police on you for <laughs> verbal stalking. <laughs> Every step you take. <laughs> I mean, that is the stalker's anthem. Every move you make, I'll be watching you. Oh my God! No, you won't, man. It's called TRO. In fact, I'm getting a permanent restraining order. You do that. I swear to God, if you went, if we all went over to Thurman over there and did nothing back, say, I see you're swinging back and forth, and I see you're running within mm, 31.2 seconds before they call the police and get you off grounds for being a pervert you're going to have at least mm, 15 to 38 kids around you like pigeons to seeds. Well, look at me, look at me, look at me. Wait, wait, look at me, look at me, look at me. So, oh my God, dear ones, I'm going to have you. Get back over here, please, thank you. Oh, actually, I think there's somebody. Yeah, why don't you, can you, yeah, go back over there. You're going to partner up. And now for 30 full excruciating seconds, <coughs> bless you. Twice? No, because I'll you need sneezers. I want you to reflect motor behavior. One is the reflector, the other is going to be the reflectee. I see you opening your mouth. See, a purist won't even say she's yawning. She gets to decide whether she's yawning. Obviously, you're yawning, so I would really say I see you're yawning. But a purist would just reflect that you're opening your mouth because it's for you to decide whether or not you're yawning or not. All right, so I know this is awkward and all that other stuff because you're adults and not three-year-olds, though so you've reawakened the inner six-year-old. You're going to reflect motor behavior. So for God's sakes, give them some motor behavior. Don't just sit like this. That makes it really hard. Don't forget we're going to switch until they get to revenge you for just sitting there. You can talk and whatnot, but move. And I want you just to reflect as best you can motor behavior, what they're physically doing. Go ahead. Ready? Thousand, one, thousand, two, go. <laughs> Switch rolls. 
Go. Okay, so talk to us. How was that for you? Besides silly or whatever, awkward, paranoid, how was it? Good? Yeah, okay, it was okay? To just label exactly what they're doing rather than trying to put meaning to it. Correct. You can't be wrong. I mean, behaviors would love this because this is not moving into the black box. This is as consensually validated as you possibly can get. I see you're looking at me. I mean, you might actually be thinking in your mind, not really looking at me the way I'm meaning it, that you're actually paying. But the best I can tell, you're looking at me. The more objective would be your eyes seem to be focused on this person called me. So it's very objective. It's very simple. It is still a baseline for me. I still go, and you're running and jumping on that. Most people call it a bear. If she's already called it a bear, and you're jumping on the bear. Now you're bouncing up and down and up and down and up and down. And now you're racing over there. Now you're grabbing that. I could go on and on and on at infinitum. So the next thing you reflect is what I'm calling ideation. And I'm using that in a very broad way. And yes, we have now entered the black box of the being. Because I don't know what you're really thinking about. But you seem to be paying attention to what I'm saying. That's an ideation. Ideation also includes attitudes. Looks like it's important to you to understand what people have to say. That's kind of like a trait. Okay, so ideation feels a little harder to grab around. Suppose I see your fingers are moving. Most people call that typing. That seems really easy. It's a little harder. It's a little more interpretive. We're putting our own stuff potentially projecting. But it's really important. You're really curious about that. You really like to learn. Now, I know that's a trade, and that'll serve you well in life. But it's also an ideation. A lot of kids want to make sure that they uh, get the paint right in the lines and it doesn't go over. You don't like it when it goes over. You want it's important to you to have it just right. That's an attitude. That's an ideation. Okay? Okay, so yes, you're going to partner up. It's going to be a little harder. You can still reflect motor if you can't think of anything else to say. I see you're brushing your hair, moving your hands around by your head. Maybe you got an itch or something. It's important for you to look neat. Obviously not for me, but never mind. All right, partner up. Are you ready? So you can talk. You can draw. You can do things that they can reflect on. And you're going to reflect ideation. And if you have nothing else to say, reflect motor. Ready? Go. Good, that's good. Perfect. Drawing a card. Okay, obviously switch, switch, and go, switch and go. Beautiful. <laughs> Maybe she's anticipating. Looks like, you, yeah, go somewhere anticipating, like leaving, you can't wait, it's getting that time. You're aware of that. You're right. Come back, come back, come back. Okay, well, that was a little harder. A little more, yeah. Okay, you'll get very fast all of that, and you'll start noticing it, and it becomes one of the more dominant things you're going to reflect, actually. If you choose to do this, I, I have no control of what you do out in the world. I'm giving you the basic way to hold the guitar. What you decide to play is up to you. The next one, which you're so familiar with, I mean, this is why you came to grad school. What is the most common thing that psychologists say to a client? How do you feel about that? Feelings. So you get to reflect, obviously, their feelings. 
right? I told you the soul, one of the ways the soul, the spirit speaks is through feelings, symbols in the body. So this should be easy. You're pros at this. But for God's sakes, that was an interesting feeling. <laughs> Looks like you were maybe a little anxious, like you weren't sure exactly or something like that. Do it. Go ahead. Feel on. Give him some feeling. You look a little sad maybe or something. You look tired. This is good. <laughs> you look really sad. You're bummed. You're going inward. <laughs> Come on back, please. I know that was short and abrupt. Sorry if I interrupted your feelings and maybe caused a little mm, frustration or anger. Reverse rolls. Feel on. <laughs> Come on back, come on back, come back, back, back. Yeah, I was gonna say, right. Like, Seems like my diagnosis is we're still doing it. Okay. Okay, so talk to us. How was that? Easier? Was easier. I would think, come on, you're pros at this. Feelings, if you can read feelings, you know, you're mad, sad, glad, scared. Looks like that's important to you. Okay? Okay. Now, if you're a purist, this is basically really, if you look at old tapes of Virginia Satir, I mean, uh, Virginia Axeline and whatnot, you will see that mostly all she's doing is reflecting motor behaviors. I see you shaking your hands. Ideation looks like you're paying attention to what I'm saying. Maybe you're really wanting to learn this. And feelings. Uh, maybe you're feeling a little curious. Maybe you're also feeling like it's about time to leave, so you're getting a little anxious and ready to go. So, any and all of the above. We certainly enter the black box when we do that. Now, I'm going to give you another dimension that sort of gets implanted in this, and that's called interpretation. From whence the above cometh. So let's imagine again, a little imaginary pumpkin comes into the office. I see you running towards that bear. You're jumping in that bear. You're looking around. It looks like you're wondering whether it's okay to jump in the bear's lap. That's an ideation, right? It's okay by me. You're bouncing. You're it looks like it's so much fun fun for you to bounce up and down in that bear. You're giggling, you're laughing. That's a feeling, right? So I've now reflected motor, ideation, feeling. It's not either or. It's this constant collage that's going on. <laughs> and now you look like maybe you're a little angry. You're really punching it hard. Maybe the bear's your brother and you really are mad at your brother. And so you're punching the bear and now you're biting at the bear's eyelids and pulling them off. That's an interpretation from whence the aboveth cometh. Okay? We are really in the black box now. Psychoanalytic type folk, this is the bedrock of their healing, right? You make the, what was it will be ego. You'll make it conscious. All these deep, and then you do it through interpretation. That is not the bedrock of humanism. <coughs> You will see, as I said, next week in the Carl tape, you'll hear me say when he goes, Mama, Mama, I will say, Oh, maybe when I'm holding you like this, you feel as if I'm your mom, or maybe you want me to go. That is an interpretation. By the way, I could be wrong. Okay, it's going to be hard. Give them something to interpret. You can draw, you can say whatever. One be the interpreter, the other interpretee. Go on, interpret. You can still reflect motor, you can reflect ideation, you can have feelings, and then make some brazen, ridiculous interpretation. Go. <laughs> You've got about maybe five, ten minutes, just, you know. Right on, man. Oh, very good. 
Okay. Okay. Boop, 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 boop. Switch. Switch. Give them something to interpret. See, mommy's milk was a little alcoholic. You're wanting mommy's milk. Okay, come back, come back. I love the laughter. So give me some, let's talk about some of the most ridiculous interpretations. Who made some ridiculous interpretations? What did you say? I interpreted her tan as her um, feeling like she needs a ray of sunshine. Oh, very nice. A ray of sunshine. Carry the warmth within. Anybody else? That's some ridiculous interpretation? No? Come on. you got to be ridiculous. Well, all right. How was that? How was that? Weird? Difficult? Fun? I mean, I'll tell you. Yes? No? What? Okay. Good. I mean, I will say this. It makes us feel smart when we do a good interpretation. I mean, we kind of feel, isn't that our job? We're psychologists. How are we different from them? Because we can interpret and reveal to them all these unconscious drives or whatever that they are not aware of. And now, it's almost like shame means we can bring that up. I'm not saying that's not also true. It can be also true. I'll say that there's a high, there's a poten more potential for projection, counter-transference, use that old term, when you start making radical interpretations. <laughs> But we'll get to that more when we get to um, psychoanalytic. What is it that you do not do in this model, which is totally contra what you've been taught or what your reflex is to do, and will be the hardest thing for you not to do in two weeks? That's what I'm asking. Correct. Well, I was going to say, which is what I'm doing right now. You do not. You do not ask questions in this model when you're being with children in this way. And it will be unbelievably hard for you, won't it? You'll take a perfectly great statement, like it won't, it'll be hard for you, and you will change it into a question, huh? And you'll be unbelievably creative how you'll take perfectly good statements and turn them into questions? It's brilliant how you'll do that. And then you'll catch yourself and you'll feel bad and you'll have that moment of shame. You'll be okay. Forgive yourself ahead of time. Don't ask questions in this model. Why? Why do we not ask questions? You're leading the play. On the nose. What brain areas are activated when you ask a question? Prefrontal. Prefrontal cortex, which is fabulous and marvelous and wonderful. And please do not hear me say never ask a question of a kid. Of course, that's how in part we build the prefrontal cortex. It makes you think. That's wonderful. When you're in a bimonic state in the middle of play with a child, you want to be in that space. Don't ask a question. It's kind of like when you're jamming on guitar. If I suddenly say, oh, what key is that in? Uh, e. Wait, how, did you learn that riff up? Look, dude, do you want to play music or do you want to talk? Do you want to play music? Yeah. Or dancing? You don't, sorry, you don't talk. About, you just move into the flow of it. You don't talk about the technique of it. Ruin. In fact, that used to be the great thing how to ruin somebody's dance game. You know, you're playing really well today. What are you doing different? You're doing something different. And they'll start thinking about what they're doing different. And then they won't do it anymore. Wah, wah. <laughs> don't ask questions. Kids get asked questions. I told you. Some, oh, it's not, hi, how old are you? What do you do? Oh, God. I told you. Some kids say you get to have three questions a day. Teenagers say that to their parents. Choose wisely because that's all I'm going to answer. Go out to the world. Reflect, reflect, reflect. <laughs> Dogs, cats, animals are fabulous to reflect on because they'll tell you. They'll do the motor. They'll do the ideation. They'll do the feeling. I see you want to go for a walk. You're so excited to see me. I can totally understand, etc. So you can even interpret. You didn't get walked enough as a puppy. Enjoy 